let's construct the first trading model. I will show you a couple of different ways we could we could trade this phenomenon. The hypothesis that we are testing here with these trading models is whether or not there is a predictive directional value in the implied yield. Uh, keep in mind that I'm not trying to show you some sort of super model that you should go and mortgage your house and steal your parents' money and in, go and invest in, in this model. Um, this is not meant to be a production model, it's not meant to be something that you, you're not on trade. It's meant to demonstrate the value of using implied yield as an input. I will show you that it works, it work, works quite well by itself, but of course the really interesting part might come if you experiment yourself further and see if you can combine it with whatever analytics you prefer that you use for other things as well. First model will look like this. We trade once a week. So only once a week we are, are checking data. Nothing is done between that. Which week data doesn't particularly matter. I think I did this, uh, I think I traded on Monday morning here, but it, it shouldn't particularly matter. So once a month, Monday morning, we check the chain, the futures chain for a set of commodity markets. I picked commodity markets here because that's where we see the most uh, or the, the most interesting pattern in, in content of accreditation. In the first simple model, we are just looking at the implied yield from a contract one, one year, one full year out from the closest contract compared to the closest contract. So for each, each commodity market, we are just calculating this 12 month implied, implied yield, nothing else. Then we rank them, we just sort the table based on this number we just calculated. I'll show you the table on the next slide. Uh, based on this, we are, we are going short the lowest five in terms of implied yield, and we're going long the highest five implied yield. That's it. That's a pretty simple model. And to keep it really simple, we're doing equal sizing, which is highly unusual in futures trading because of our volatility differences. But let's keep it simple. Let's not give uh, the model any sort of advantage by giving it a fancy um, allocation model, but keep it that simple. Now, the, the table that we calculate on a weekly basis will look like this. A short summary here. Just calculate one year out. You see when I made this, the front contract was, uh, this was in, um, in, in uh, spring of 2017. I made this table, it looks like, and it picks the contract exactly one year out and calculate the implied yield. The top five backwardation, uh, we go long, top five contango, at the bottom, we go short. Without caring about trends or anything else, that's it. So, such a simple, naive model, can that possibly create any sort of, of value? Well, for a first try, not that bad. It's certainly not production grade model. It's not something I would run out and trade, but that's not the point. We are looking here for a predictive value in the information and it looks like we found something. In this case, here, um, what you're looking at, first of all, is the blue line is the result of this backtest. And of course, I've taken into account uh, commissions, exchange fees, slippage, uh, the usual. The blue line is the result of the trading strategy. The uh, orange line, which I nicely uh, missed in, in labeling with a legend, the, uh, the orange line is the S&P 500 total return index. Uh, why am I comparing with the index? because everybody will compare you to the index. No matter, no matter what you do in trading, you will always be compared to this index, uh, good or bad. Even if your trading strategy is totally different, if you're up 10% and the market is down 10%, you're a hero. If you're up 10% and the market is up 15%, you're not. So always nice to compare with. And also another reason to compare with this is that uh, what you would like to achieve for most type of trading, what most people want to achieve is something uncorrelated, is not correlated to the index. Uh, so what we're seeing here is we ended up with an annualized return of nearly 11%, sharp ratio of 
those are not brilliant numbers, but um, for a naive strategy like this, uh, not too bad. So, did I pick the 12 months because that showed the best result? Not really, that was at random. So let's um, let's try nine months. We always, next approach, we do the same exact model, same rules, but instead of trading 12 months out, we're trading nine months out. We get this. And here we get improved results. We get now over 15% return at a shop ratio of 0.85. Started to look more interesting. But again, we are looking for predictive value. So always nice to do some variation in input settings. I find that any sort of quantitative trading approach, which is overly sensitive to the, uh, the exact inputs, is probably not going to be too robust going forward. So let's try one more. How about if we do six months out? We always trade half a year out. Well, interestingly, the results improved even further. Now we're looking at annualized return of over 20% with a sharp of nearly one. If, by the way, you think that an annualized return over time of 20% is too low to bother with, then you're in the wrong business. Uh, you probably find better also at the casino in that case. Uh, just like you remember, you, sh you should remember that um, some of the very best in this business, some of the, the, the true legends of this business became multi-billionaires by their ability to compound at about 20% a year. Any given year, of course, anybody can have significantly more, but if you spend 20 years compounding at 20%, you're a superstar. So, okay, so based on this, we can say that there's probably predictive value in the term structure, but Maybe there's something wrong with the test. Maybe we should do some totally different way of, of testing and trading, or setting up the rules. So we're doing different variation of testing the same theory. Here's the next, here's the next model. Again, we trade only weekly. Again, we start by calculating implied yield tables for each market, each commodity market every week. But in this case, we don't care about how many months out. We don't care if it's three, six, uh, 12 months out, whatever it is. We calculate the whole way. And we are just considering the maximum value, the, the, uh, the top, the, 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 the uh, absolute top contango or top backwardation. We're only considering the extreme points. So only one extreme point per market is considered. And we pick the highest. So if the, if the, um, the implied yield tends to be the, uh, if it was one week the highest in the contract three months out, we take that. If it's 12 months out, we take that. And we set a limit here on, we can only trade if it's 15% plus or minus. If they have a 15% negative annualized yield, we go short. If it's 15% positive annualized yield, we go long. Again, there's no stops, so no targets, no indicators, and no history of any kind. Just this. The table calculated would be something like this. It's very similar to what you saw before. Here is uh, the gas oil market. We calculate the implied yield for the entire curve. We find, well, you can see here there are two points that could be of interest. We have the August 2020 and the June 2020. But the June contract has a higher implied yield. So that's the only one we consider for this model. In this case, for this, for this week, we would go long the June contract. And again, we hold it for one, for one week. Next week, we take whatever has the highest yield done. Now the result of this, well, gets a little bit on the silly side because now we started to get, mostly because of 2008, we get Pretty high returns. Now we have an annualized return of 30% with a sharp of 0.98. That's the highest numbers we saw so far. Of course, keep in mind that we are seeing volatility here of 32%, which uh, is a bit on the high side. Now, one potential problem with this approach you're looking at now is um, since we are acquiring this 15%, and if you look in detail or if you are experienced, you look empirically you know that 15% contango is very common. 15% backwardation is much less common. Meaning that a model like this with um, 
symmetric symmetric requirements is 15 percent on both sides will probably end up having too many contango positions too few backwardation we have too many short not enough longs so let's balance it here's the same model again so same rule we are we're just considering the uh, the maximum implied yield on each contract oh sorry on each each market for each week and the requirement is 15% minimum contango and 0% backwardation. Yeah, you see that the annualized return went down to 20%, but we also cut the volatility in half, so we got a much higher Sharpe ratio, which is for most people in the world, um, at least on the professional side, a preferable scenario. Sharpe ratio 1.2 on a futures model is, um, well, if you realize that, you have a very good model. That's a very profitable model if you can if you can um, make that into real result on a proper size portfolio. So how do all these things compare? How do they stack up if we compare them to each other? Well, we're looking at this. The black the black line here is again the S and P 500 total return index. Uh, total return meaning that we include reinvested dividends. The easiest way in the world to make any trading strategy look great is to compare it against the S&P 500 price index, which is cheating, but pretty much every bank in the world does it anyway. No laws against that. So here you see that all the approaches over time beat the index, not over any given time period, of course. If you start this in 2009, the index would have beaten at least half of them. But that's not the point. Beating the index in the bull market is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a fool's game. Uh, beating the index in the long run is a steady, is a more steady approach. Um, it's unrealistic to say that you're going to beat the market in all conditions, of course. Some of these lines are showing more attractive performance than others. But again, the point here today is not to find the best possible model, but to demonstrate whether or not there's a predictive value in term structure. And I think this graph itself should speak a clear language. If there were no, if there was no predictive value in term structure, we would see a more of a random pattern. We would see uh, lines going both up and down. We would see much bigger losses. Um, there seemed to be some value here. That's the point I'm trying to make. 